Hello and welcome to Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Jamp and Luke Cutfer. Hello, hi, howdy. This week we're talking about imitation illnesses and dummy diseases. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But uh, first, a thanks yeah. to our patrons. Thank you. Thanks. That took you a little while, didn't it? Yeah. Sorry. I'm liking... <laughs> Don't worry, we've got a question to move quickly on from that pitiful, pitiful thank you. <laughs> the question is, when do you last remember vomiting? Head over to our channel on YouTube and leave a comment there letting us know when you last vomited. I want to know. I very much want to know. When's the last time you remember vomiting? Well, I don't know if I can say the one, <laughs> my, last time I vomited, because, trigger warning, I made myself vomit. Oh, no, Luke. Yeah, but that's what, oh, no. Only because I felt really ill. Not, oh. Yeah, not for like a, uh, like a reason for me wanting to vomit for any other reason than I felt ill. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Champ? I probably vomited while I was sick, but the last time I actually probably remember vomiting was uh, when I went out drinking at 4pm with a friend, and I hadn't eaten anything all day, and by 8pm I was projectile vomiting into the streets of Soho. <laughs> oh, mine was like three weeks ago, by the way. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, yeah. Mine is similar to Jam's, in yeah. that the last time I vomited was because I, I, I drank too much. Um, usually I yeah. don't get hungover. This day my body decided that I would get hungover and it didn't know how to deal with it. You're getting old. Yeah. You were there. Remember that? We were. Yeah, we saw you. Yeah. Was I? Yeah. In your state. I yeah, was dis- you not remember? disgustingly it was kind of hungover. When was this? We were meant to be recording Sci Guys and it ended up not happening for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, put it this way. I could do what I want before Sci Guys and I'm usually fine. It was just this one time out of many that I <laughs> that my body said, hey, uh, no. Oh, yeah. And it was like all of the time. It was all of the hangovers that I haven't had throughout my life seemed to come together you, into yeah. this one specific yeah. one like, we've been waiting Scott Pilgrim do you yeah. <laughs> but that is not exactly what we're talking about today as I said up top we are talking about imitation illnesses and dummy diseases now our patrons have voted for this topic they have voted for it can you guess what it is from this I'm- imitation mm-hmm. illnesses and dummy diseases is it like illnesses that look like other illnesses oh not quite this is munchausen by proxy oh. Syndrome. Oh. not munchausen okay. syndrome which we may cover in the future but munchausen by proxy so do you know what it is why don't you tell me what you think it is i know the vague story of gypsy rose oh how would you describe it? it's where somebody in a position of care for someone else usually someone who's disabled or a child Mm -hmm. either pretends that the child is ill or makes them ill for i don't know for sympathy like what i don't know or like in order to be in the caring role in order to assume the caring role let's you're pretty much spot on let's kind of move away from the why yeah Yeah. because that is that is a tough one yeah we'll get to it later because there's this is a really complicated thing and we i'm like i'm not not gonna lie i may get some of this just a little bit off because there's conflicting stuff from different places and really when you start looking into all of this it's kind of all over the place so forgive me for any inaccuracies i've tried to be as accurate as possible take from as many sources as possible uh but the nhs will say something different to some studies that i've read from you know uh, 2017 18 2020 yeah it's it's it, and a lot of these studies are also about munchausen itself so munchausen by proxy uh here's a quote from the nhs fabricated or induced illness fii is a rare form of child abuse it happens when a parent or oh. carer exaggerates or deliberately causes symptoms of illness in the child now this is an okay definition i think i don't think it's a perfect one because as you said it's not just uh, parents and children it mm. can also be seen in uh, sort of uh, someone that is caring for, say, an elderly person yeah. or someone that's caring for someone that's um, disabled. Now, it's it's also no longer called uh, Munchausen by proxy. You probably spotted that oh. there when I said fabricated or induced illness. There are a number of names. Fabricated or induced illness is obviously used by the NHS. Oh. Um, it's classified under factitious disorders in the DSM-5. Now, you definitely know about factitious disorders because I have mentioned them recently what other episode have we done in the wow. past few weeks that um that had a guest that also spoke about um sort of an appearance of symptoms of something not <gasps> an illness but appearance of symptoms without the actual cause of said symptoms is it hysterical pregnancies yes luke well done hysterical pregnancies yes luke, Yay. well done yes exactly hysterical pregnancies so you can see we were talking about hysterical pregnancies and that kind of brought up the concept of factitious disorders because those are 
Those are kind of, you can broadly describe them as kind of when, um, <laughs> it's difficult when there are there's no cause for symptoms and not just no apparent I guess no apparent cause for symptoms um, but symptoms are presenting nonetheless however I'm fairly sure that with factitious disorders there is so at least the idea that the symptoms are almost being made up in some way mm. rather than being due to some unknown cause right mm. because those are obviously two different things it's different to say this person is ill and seems to be genuinely ill, and I don't know why. Yeah. Um. Like say, let's say fibromyalgia, right? Where oh, this person has pain, but I can't tell. Like it, it's it's it, but we don't necessarily know why where the pain is coming from or something, right? Right. So you mean the symptoms in the child? So the symptoms in the child, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. like because there's also the symptoms of being the person who's doing the thing, being the adult in that situation, and they. We don't necessarily, like you said, we don't know the why. We don't necessarily know what the cause of that is. Yeah, that's tough as well, because I wouldn't even necessarily call those symptoms. And they're described on the NHS as signs. And signs and symptoms are different things, as people in our comments have uh, have told us before. Signs and symptoms are different. Mm. Um, it, the, the actual difference is not super important right now. But the, the, sort of the symptoms of the child uh, are obviously false, right? Or, or okay. False or induced by the They're parent. false or induced, yes, yeah. exactly. Um when we start talking about the sort of signs of of these sort of factitious disorders in the carer role, that is more complex because when you when you call that a symptom, that would almost um, imply sort of illness in some sense, and that's that's putting a lot. You know, I mean, that's putting a lot on there. It's very difficult to uh, determine whether there is sort of illness or not. It, it's very complicated and potentially right. absolving them of responsibility for their actions. To as some well. extent, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, as I was saying, factitious disorders are in the DSM five. We've spoken about them recently in our hysterical pregnancies episode with no offence, which you should definitely go ahead and check out. Not necessary for this episode, but it's a good time nonetheless. So, factitious disorder imposed on another um, is the is the name for Munchausen's by proxy. Now, um, this is, you, you can see you can see what's going on here, obviously. You've got factitious disorders, and um, now in the DSM-5, those are split, I think, into two different sort of, uh, into two different sort of groups. You've got factitious disorder imposed on, um, I think, self, um, the self, or, you know, factitious disorder imposed on uh, oneself, and then factitious disorder imposed on another, FDIA. Now, it's essentially people with, with um, FDIA, or in the case of FDIA, rather, they will sort of pretend that the person that is in their care is sick or they'll make them sick. Um, and there is no apparent gain for this. And this is why yeah, it would be it's considered like a, a disorder or something. Or a yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right. Because now if I was to if I was you know in a position of care over Jamp and I was to be given lots and lots of money. For yeah. um for Jamp being not very well, well it would be in my best interest to make Jamp not very well, and I have to say I would absolutely do it. And society would look at me and say, Corey, this makes sense. We understand why you're. We don't agree. It's naughty and wrong, but we understand why you're doing it. Yeah. Respect the hustle. Whereas with factitious disorder imposed on another, <laughs> where, whereas with factitious disorder imposed on another, I feel like the the general the, the reason that this is sort of considered a, a more of a sort of disorder is because that we we can't as a sort of mm. your average rational person cannot see any no point clear. of gain yeah. for this you know um so they'll pretend that the person in their care is sick and they'll look for treatment um and they'll go to different they could go to different sort of care facilities for this sort of thing and it's been around i think in the literature so munchausen syndrome has been around in the literature since 1951 mm. so it's it's you know, quite an old, I mean, relatively old in terms of like, you know, we've known about it for a while. Um, and here's a quote from a study that I was reading from uh, 2017. Uh, the main characteristics of factitious disorder imposed on self are feigning of physical and or psychological signs and symptoms and induction of injury or disease associated with identified fraud. Um, so that's when it's imposed on self. Yeah. I don't really want to talk too much about that today, but it's very difficult to extricate the two because they're, I mean, they have almost exactly the same name. Do you know I mean, they're all there. Mm. And whenever you see a paper about one, it's almost always a paper about the other as well. So don't get these confused. So you've got Munchausen's or factitious disorder um, imp imposed on self. And then you've got Munchausen's by proxy, which is now called uh, factitious disorder imposed on another. Yeah. Mm, Was that, yes. that clear? Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. So as I said, it was first uh, described in 1951. That's Munchausen syndrome was first described in 1951 by Dr. Richard Allen John Asher uh, because he was he's had patients who were sort of 
um, sort of seem to intentionally be um, making um, like sort of creating symptoms in themselves. And he was like, okay, well, let's just call it this. That's what this is. It's Munchausen's. Um, and then in 1977, um, so a good 26 years later, Sir Samuel Roy Meadow, fantastic names today, uh, uh, then, um, and this is, I'll just quote this from a paper that I read, used the term Munchausen syndrome by proxy to describe children whose mothers produce histories of illness to their children and who support such histories by fabricated physical signs and symptoms or even altered laboratory tests. Ooh. So is that crucial that they fabricate the symptoms as in they actually make them happen or just that they pretend they happened i think both are the same thing yeah it could be either right. i think both are, i mean as in pretending that they happened and pretend and, and making them ha- there I, well, I just mean one's one is uh, that's another level of abuse to actually make your child ill yeah yeah rather than just pretending your child is ill that's like a different level yeah and uh, you've hit on this uh pretty you've hit this nail on the nail on the head there that this is really difficult to talk about as a sort of mental disorder, despite the fact that it's in the DSM-5, because it's almost inherently, I mean, I say almost inherently, it is inherently abusive, mm. right? Now, you can see how um, people with mental health disorders can be abused or abuse others, um, and people often talk about narcissists, for example, as being inherently abusive, which, to some extent, is not very fair to those people, mm. right? Because they're 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 living their lives as themselves and they've like this is how their brain sort of works this is how they engage with the world and it's it seems almost callous to cast anyone with narcissist uh narciss- narcissistic personality disorder as uh an irredeemable awful person right yeah whereas and i'm not saying that you know um that people with uh, a factitious disorder uh impose on another um or present with that that way are irredeemable or awful people or whatever but Inherent in that um, sort of di- diagnosis is an abusive relationship, right? With a with child. A, with a child, which yeah. I find... Or, or with your with, own or child. With, or yeah. with someone that's in your care. Yeah, yeah. Which I find oh, okay, really yeah. interesting, right? Yeah. Like, it, it is it is interesting that inherent in this sort of disorder is abuse. And you don't often see that, Yeah. right? Yeah. And that's why when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about a disorder. We're also talking about cases of... Uh, fairly extreme abuse right yeah because it's interesting when you said the nhs definition is it went very quickly to is a form of child abuse yeah and it was and i found that interesting because that's almost i mean that's important um because especially in the case of children it's so important that the the person doing the abuse is a strong second in the (laughs) compared to the child being abused um but what's interesting is is that it's almost like um it's almost like the, the 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 abuse is um if if you view it like a like a mental disorder the abuse is a manifestation of the mental disorder whereas um this is sort of going the abuse is primary and then the cause of the abuse that's sort of secondary you, you know what I mean yeah no I mean I, what I was going to say is that you've hit the nail you've you've done it again that like you're spot on that is why we don't necessarily call it Munchausen's uh, by proxy anymore um that's why th- th- there's been this sort of shift but then again it's still it's it, there's still some holdovers from when it was called that. It's difficult. It's not quite a sort of um, it's not quite a situation of multiple personality disorder versus uh, DID, dissociative identity disorder, where there has been a very sort of clear shift between um, multiple personalities to DID, mm-hmm. right? Um, or even say gender identity disorder to uh, gender dysphoria. There, there's quite clear cut shifts there. You're not necessarily going to be seeing lots of papers talking about um, gender gender identity disorder uh, in you know 2020, 2017, 2018 because yeah, it was updated yeah. in DSM five in oh gosh, come on off the top of your head, Corey, maybe 2013 ish. Yeah, one of the DSM five doesn't really matter. Um, but you know, what I mean, that's when it was updated, and once that was updated, the sort of language changed. But Munchausen's is still in papers now, despite the fact that they'll they'll go on to say it's called factitious disorder, and it, it's almost right. like clickbait, you know, because yeah. that's what people know it by. Well, that's that episode be called. It's gonna be called Munchausen's by proxy. <laughs> yeah, because I've never heard of the other. Yeah. The other name. Well, no one else yeah. is. Gonna, no one's gonna know what it is. But and that's what was. That was what was voted in by the patrons, and yeah. I try to keep it the same as what they've asked for. That's really yeah. interesting, though. Like what you say, though, is that calling it Munchausen's by proxy, because that is the colloquial name, and that's what people knows. It knows it know it mm-hmm. by. That's important, especially when you're making a podcast and people want to find the podcast and mm-hmm. they want to learn about that thing. But. It, it's almost like an entire separate category because Munchausen's, when you're just making yourself ill or pretending to be or whatever, is a different thing 
to when you're abusing a child. So yeah, and this this is what this is a uh, part of the reason for the shift in language. I think is to focus more on the victim yeah. of yeah. The yeah. sort of this abuse. So instead of so you still got um uh so Munchausen syndrome is it's not really necessarily called that. Um, anymore either it's still called factitious disorder imposed yeah. itself mm. and then you've got pe- uh, factitious disorder imposed in another and you can see how that's focusing a little bit more on the the, yes, other, the other rather yeah. than um, by proxy by proxy, by proxy. Yeah. yeah right yeah. yeah um and that that i think that was the reason pro- uh, uh, potentially for that shift um but speaking of sort of the the old term right which we may use sort of throughout this just for um understandability right for the people listening mm-hmm. uh, we'll try not to but it's it, it it it's obviously the one that we know. It's the one that they'll know. So, um, the term Munchausen syndrome actually, um, as I said, came about in 1951. But can you guess um, why it's Munchausen? Because if you remember, Doctor <laughs> yeah. Richard Allen John Asher came up with this. It wasn't Mun- a name. Is Munchausen German? Is it? Uh, yeah, it sounds German. German. I believe it, it. It sounds German to me. Is Munchausen. the first person who was doing it or was discovered to do it or studied doing it? No, no, not at all. This is this is great. This is actually really interesting. So um, Munchausen, it comes from Baron Munchausen, um, also known as Karl Friedrich, uh, gosh, goodness me, Hieronymus Brecht. Freer von Munchau- Munchausen. Or it'd be Munchausen, oh, wouldn't it? Anyway, I, like my German pronunciation isn't great, but um, it's it comes from someone who lived from 1720 to 1797, oh. who told uh, he was a storyteller and he told uh, basically tall tales, very uh, very uh, <laughs> uh, like sort of uh, unbelievable stories about his life. He was known to be a, an embellisher of the truth. Yeah, so yeah, like the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, exactly. So it's almost like if you think about if you think about it, it's uh, it's so it's named after a historical figure. <laughs> Who was who least, didn't even pretend to be ill? No, or who in he? some degree was known for like you know embellishing and lying. So okay, put it this way: it's like narciss- narcissistic personality disorder. Oh, go Corey, awesome, bringing it back <laughs> around completely accidentally. Uh, what is narcissistic personality disorder named after? Narcissus. And who is Narcissus? Uh, a Greek oh, god. god. No. no. Narcissus, and I may be slightly off on this because I've not studied ancient Greek in some time. Narcissus oh, yes. was a Melbourne person who was, yeah. uh, who was so captivated yeah. by his own reflection in the water that he could not, he could not bear to yeah. move away um, and look away from it. And he turned into... <laughs> do you remember? A daffodil. A mirror. <laughs> a daffodil. A daffodil. Which, um, of course. Look, which, That's if, look, if I've ever heard this story. No, but if you look at the if you look at the sort of um, if you look at the scientific name for a daffodil, what is it? Narcissus. Uh, is it? Great. Yes. Didn't know that. Yeah. Great. Learned something new. So that's where this all comes from. Daffod- You're very excited about this. Do you not know what I love this stuff? I remember never the Narcissus it. story now you said it, but I've never even heard the Narcissus story. I love really? How, really? Yeah, never. Fell in love with their own reflection in the mirror. No, no. In, you know, in, the, in the river they look no. in the river and they fall in love with their own reflection no, and then they, yeah. I think they like starve Never. they like starve staring at their own reflection because they don't do anything all day yeah yeah just die but yeah, yeah basically just sit there and uh, look <laughs> no, um, it was no. it's like a myth yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so funny yeah so it was um, yeah so he was he was a demigod he was the son of the river god um, uh, Cephasus and, and a nymph uh, mm. Lirope um, and he was just very good looking caught his oh. reflection in, in the in a sort of in, in a sort of pond or a sort of you know lake yeah. or whatever mm. did not move turned into a daffodil how fun is that the first time he'd ever seen himself <laughs> I mean they, w- they, don't have, they probably didn't have many mirrors uh, kicking about back then did they oh yeah it's a big revolution when they invented mirrors wow. only the it's the French who invented mirrors and then they wouldn't tell anyone how to make them and then the mirrors were really expensive someone invented the mirrors and then they were really expensive and then people who made mirrors were like super famous and, and rich and high up in the in the hierarchy and um then another country figured out how to make mirrors and the entire mirror industry collapsed. No. I think well, mirrors have been dated back as about 4,000 uh, 4, BCE, but um, I know of stories, and this is from Pokemon, I know about mirrors um, existing uh, a long, long time ago because you would just polish, I think, bronze mm. um, until it became very, very shiny. And obviously it's not as good as the mirrors that we've got today, which have like very little sort of color rate, like, you know, yeah. they don't yeah. um, discolor your sort of a reflection very much. Uh, but you could polish, um, you polish a metal like bronze. And the reason oh, I know wow. that is because there's a Pokemon that is entirely based off of a bronze mirror. <laughs> Great. Bronzor. There you go. Oh, yeah. 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 I didn't even think about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> ding a ling ling it's the ad bell. <laughs> what are we advertising today? We're advertising our spicy merch. Uh, I am wearing the tardy grade beanie that we're selling. Uh, it's a little little tardy grade boy, little water bear going ooh. And if you like the tardigrade beanie, you could also get our matching tardigrade t-shirt with a little smiling tardigrade that isn't going ooh, but is going 
And if you like the tiny grey t-shirt, you might also like the Psy Guys little pin badges we've made. Wow. They don't match, but they do say Psy Guys, and you can show your love for Psy Guys in your pin badge collection, and they're very cute. Yeah, it's the actual logo. And there's still a chance to grab our Psy Guys calendar, which will give you a discount on the future calendar if you get it now. And an extra mm. episode of Psy Guys, all about calendars. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, the, they will the get The calendar that. episode, yeah. Well, that's the spawn from ourselves. Back to the episode. <laughs> So uh, bringing it back to Munchausen's, I really do enjoy in science where we take names from mythology and um, and, and the past and history and all of that. It, I think it's very interesting. It you know adds a very adds a fun little quality of history to mm. science. So Munchausen named after someone that just, just some said a some lot of, bloke. Yeah, it's not just some guy that told a lot of tall yeah, tales. What? So let's kind of get into some of the stats here. So. I don't know if I've said it explicitly, but you could probably uh, gather that factitious disorder imposed on another and factitious disorder itself, um, or factitious di- disorder imposed on self, um, FDIA and FDIO, so, <laughs> FDIS. So hard to say. See, Munchausen's is so much easier, but we'll, we'll make an effort. These disorders are rare. They're not common, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, apparently, um, I think maybe... Okay, so I say they're rare and not common. This is going to sound more common to you. But you need to think about <laughs> you need to think about the numbers here. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, around about one percent of hospital admi- admissions could, uh, uh, roughly, could be attributed to Munchausen. Just like just like gingers. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Now <laughs> that sounds like a lot. Yeah, that does sound like a lot. But not everyone that uh, the people that are people that have factitious disorder, uh, and this is factitious disorder imposed on self. So people that have FDIS um, are more likely to go to the hospital. Yes. More often. Right. So they will be gotcha. overrepresented that, yeah. in the number of, because I have been to the hospital the maybe point. a couple times in the past year. Yeah. Right? That is not that I mean that's and that's like uncommonly uh, that's yeah. that's an uncommonly I high amount of times. Years. Right, I've, exactly. I've not been since twenty sixteen. Exactly. Whereas someone that um someone that is consistently um thinking themselves to be or making themselves to be ill in some way is going to be um visiting more hospitals more often but right? i'd imagine that factitious disorder imposed on other has low admission rate because they don't want to find out that the child doesn't have the illness yeah no you think that but <laughs> I, I don't have the admission rates to hospitals right. but what i i i do have the sort of uh so it it, it accounts for 0.04 percent of uh child abuse cases uh, just mm. to sort of clarify for fdis wow. um in uh hospitalized patients it's 1.3%, not 1%. I apologize. <laughs> um, but yeah, 0.04% of child abuse cases. Um, so not very common, but then it's you, you can understand why maybe, like, why why that might be, right? You're more likely just to be a person, right, than to be a person with a child. Yeah. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying you're more likely to be a person right. without a child. You're okay. more likely to be yeah. a person Because a load any, of the yeah. child abuse cases are not people with children or people in care. They're just dreadful people who abuse children. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, hold on, sorry. So, when you're talking about child abuse stats, you're more likely to be a person that's not a carer of a child than you are to be a person who is, who is a carer of a child. So, what I'm saying is that with um, it, with factitious disorder imposed on self, you're you, it necessarily in order to uh, have uh, to to sort of present with factitious disorder imposed on another, there needs to be another that, that's yeah. in your care. Mm-hmm. You're more likely to be just a person, either with someone or without someone in your care. Than you are to be someone yeah. with someone in your care yeah. because um, included in uh, because having someone in your care is included in the group of just being a person. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. But what I'm but you're 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 comparing different statistics. One was comparing statistics of hospital admissions, and the other was is is comparing statistics of child abuse cases. Yeah, what what I'm saying is that uh, so I'm not trying to compare these two stats. What I'm saying is that you can understand why. Um, why you'd probably see less hospital admissions for people. So you had said um, you would be less likely to see hospital admissions for uh, factitious disorder imposed on another yeah. because they don't want um, to be found out. Yeah. I'm saying that's not necessarily the best way to look at it um, because part of it is that they that they 
that they think the child is ill, and so they're taking them to the doctor and making them ill, and and all of these different things, right? They, they actually think the child is ill, as opposed I, this to different. This is what's yeah. really tough for me to figure yeah. out, right? We'll, yeah. we'll parse through it as we're going through the yeah. episode, right? But um, it, whether they think the child is ill or not, or whether they're just, they know the child isn't ill um, on all levels, and they are intentionally <laughs> making them ill, like do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's hard mm. to know how someone rationalizes something to themselves. Yeah. Um, so I guess on some level you could say that they know the child isn't ill, but regardless, they'll still take them to doctors and whatnot and make them ill. Um, and yeah, sure, they might be. They might be slightly less likely to want to um, take the child uh, or take the person in their care yeah. uh, to see a physician. Um, but part of, I think, actually part of this this, this concept is that they are taking them in, into into sort of um, into hospitals and, and to see doctors and whatnot. Mm. Um, and what I'm what I'm here what I'm saying here is that the reason that you might that you might um, see a discrepancy there is that um, you're more likely to be a person. Right. So you're more likely to just be a person um, that is either caring for someone or is not caring for someone than you are to be a person who is caring for someone. Right. Because being a person that is in ca- that is caring for someone is included is a subset of just people. So what you're saying is, is that hypothetically, um, if if we were to have a statistic on the number of people who are h- admitted to hospital due to by proxy um, or inflicted on other um, that. It might be true that it's that it's lower because of what I said, which is that um, they might not admit them. That might be true. We don't know. Don't mm-hmm. don't take that as as true. But it also might be lower because um, there are less people with children than there are just people. Um, so you're more likely to be a person than you are to be a carer. Um, and so the statistics might will will naturally be higher because they they will they will make up a larger proportion of hospital admissions mm-hmm. because there are more people than there are people with children. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's an incredibly low percentage of child abuse cases are Munchausen's by proxy, yeah. which is super interesting. Uh, it's it's actually very 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 rare. Point zero zero four percent of child abuse cases. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, there's there could be any number of reasons for that. But like the you, the the thing is that you've got to. If you look at it this way, you've got to both um, be in a caring role yeah. for um, someone else, and also be in some way predisposed to this disorder. Yeah. disorder yeah. And then also get like you know not be caught before it gets to the point of like serious abuse, yeah. abuse yeah. cases. And it would, and then also like you know, um, you could have it being a, it could be acute or it could be a chronic sort of thing where it could be happen in one instance or it could happen over a long period of time. If it happens in one instance, then it's not likely to be um, caught up in that sort of child abuse. But then also, it is just not very common. Yeah, um, it's not very common at all. So th- that's that is why. But um, no, I think it's I think it's definitely incredibly um, sort of interesting right because as i said you could either be having sort of um, a single episode sort of acute or chronic multiple episodes and um the sort of uh the sort of rate that it occurs um or the rate that this sort of happens to children younger than 16 years old is about zero point i think zero zero two zero point zero zero two to zero point zero 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 five or zero percent yeah, percent <laughs> That's, of children. Okay. Yeah, Goodness under me. the age of sixteen, it's not common at all. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, I mean, okay. So uh, to to make it slightly more understandable, zero point zero five to two children for every hundred thousand children. Okay. Under the age of sixteen, um, right. usually this happens when they're uh, between fourteen months to two point seven years old, and that's usually when the the, the oh, caregiver God. is sort of diagnosed with this. Which so again, that's like max seven hundred cases in the UK. If everybody was children. If everybody was children. <laughs> sure. yeah. So like 30 cases, maybe 20 cases in the UK. Yeah, not yeah. common. Not common yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, and <laughs> it's, everyone was children. It's, and the, the thing is, what's interesting is that up top you brought up Gypsy Rose, who yeah. uh, was, gosh, in her 20s, really, by the when, when it was sort of all found out. Oh, shit, I didn't know she was that old. Yeah, yeah. She, I mean, she was, I th- I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure she was... Um, I think she was about twenty one. She her she was uh, her age was lied about. So yeah. th- that, there were those yeah, issues yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But that is, I guess, that's an outlier really, because if you if you look at the sort of uh, data, it, it shows that, as I said, between fourteen months and uh two point seven years old is mm-hmm. usually when um the caregiver is sort of diagnosed. Um and that makes sense if you think about it, because it's far easier to make a child look like a baby seem ill because they cannot talk. 
and you yeah, can feed yeah. them yeah. things and they will just take it. And you're also much more monitored around that time as well. Exactly. You, you, they're, you're, they're more likely to go into the, to, the, to the doctors and um, and also it's just, it's generally easier to make a baby ill because they're not yeah. very good at being alive. <laughs> yeah. 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 They've not quite learned that They're skill. quite dependent on you. So, exactly. Yeah. They're entirely dependent on you. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I... I know it's an interesting thing you said, like near the top of this episode, mm-hmm. which I'm sure you may may come on to, but um, I I've been waiting for you to come on to it, and I want, I want to pull it up. So you said in your definition of Munchausen syndrome, mm-hmm. or in the definition you gave that I think was the one that was like in the 70s, mm-hmm. that it's of mothers. Now, is this a thing? Like you use the word mothers, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, it might be a dated. It might be a dated thing. Um, but I just, yeah, I wondered, oh. I wonder what it was about. I didn't even register that. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, so that was, uh, yeah, that was the initial definition. Yeah. Obviously that was in the seventies. Mm. Uh, now there is almost some precedent for that because, um, it is, it is, it is like it, any caregiver can be the, the sort of the person that's done it, that does it. And that's really funny that you mentioned that because that's literally the next stat that I had on my page. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's usually the, it's usually the mother of the child that uh, sort of does this. So um, if we look at the sort of common characteristics of um, factitious disorder imposed uh, on another, uh, usually uh, the, the the sort of perpetrator is, uh, or the sort of the perpetrator or the person with the disorder is female, um, usually the victim's mother. Um, they uh, have a history of sort of childhood childhood abuse or a history of Munchausen syndrome themselves, um, a personality disorder or a lack of support or disengagement from the other parent. Um, they're often well-educated and this will come up later. It makes really? sense as to why they're, they'd be often well-educated. Um, they rarely leave the bedside of the child or victim. Um, they, this, again, I, I want to be clear, like we're, we're talking about like, a, a sort of abuse here um uh so you know the sort of the victim um uh, and they then well, can, they can also uh have a close relationship with hospital staff because obviously they'll be there <laughs> yeah often um and if uh, i found a paper that looked at um data from 108 articles um which included 81 case reports and again this doesn't sound great in terms of data but it's so uncommon that case studies are generally the most common thing and then yeah. the, the this the sort of you have to have other studies that look at those case studies because i mean realistically trying to find for one thing trying to f- you can't really study someone that has factitious disorder imposed on another um after they've sort of been diagnosed yeah. necessarily because they were abusing a child and that and you know there is that has been sort of a dealt with Right, so it's not, yeah, it's not like going to carry on from that point. <laughs> exactly. So it's not quite like having, say, a bipolar disorder, where yeah. if you're diagnosed with bipolar disorder, we can look at the people that have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder yeah. and just watch them for a bit and see what they do. You know, because it, it's it, you know, it's almost like, um, say, you've got OCD. You take away, you you, you sort of take away the sort of um, uh, compulsions or you know the sort of ticks or whatever. Yeah. Um, you, you, you like you, you're not going to be studying the full thing, right? Yeah. So it's it's really hard to study this. So you've got to look at the sort of case studies, um, sort of individually. Almost all of the perpetrators were uh, female, ninety one percent female, um, one percent female and male, and seven percent unreported. Um, so one percent female and male would be obviously both. Both. Um, <clears throat> and there could be a bias here in who they're doing who they're doing this with. But then also again, bear in mind who's the primary caregiver. Usually, yeah, it could be know? a bias towards like most of the time the caregiver will be the mother yeah yeah exactly yeah so um 23 cases um it, 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 sorry 23 cases of the ones that looked at so 28 percent <clears throat> the perpetrator um uh had a psychiatric diagnosis um of uh factitious disorder imposed on self oh sorry uh, in, th- in 28 percent of the cases um the the perpetrator had a psychiatric diagnosis. In 10% of those, it was a uh, factitious disorder imposed on self, depression in 9%, and uh, personality disorders oh. in 7%. Um, and so that's not, uh, obviously, not of the... It's of the 20 that's of the, that's a, No, 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 that's of the total. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, of, of the sort of total, not of the 28%, because you've got 10, 9, and 7, and then the rest are Mm. much much uh much less than that but yeah the, there's often personality sort of uh disorders um mm. involved in this and that's why it's hard to really call this a disorder in and of itself um and why it was kind of described more as a syndrome i guess because a syndrome is sort of a collection of sort of uh symptoms or signs or, or whatever um and a disorder is slightly different from that 
it, it and this is it's kind of similar to what we were talking about um sort of maladaptive daydreaming if you recall because since it's so it's 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 fairly common for a psychiatric diagnosis to i mean you know 28 percent um I, I one would assume that's uh, i'm fairly sure that's above the sort of um the the, the mean for you know the, the average person yeah right i think the mean is about a third of people in their entire lifetime will exactly something like wow. that, yeah. so um you, you can see how um that may that may that may affect sort of like um the presentation of this um and it, it it's difficult to say whether it's it would be necessarily a thing in itself or something that could be caused by other things or it could act it could obviously of course be both mm. So in more than a third, there was familial conflict or abuse. That was thirty-six percent. Seventeen percent had people, the the, the, the sort of um, the person with the the disorder, working in healthcare. Um, and the most common type of uh, sort of falsification was induction, as in you make them, you make them, you make them. That's why you, that's how you fake it. But in fifteen percent of cases, there was more than one um, type of falsification. Um, uh, <laughs> this is this is mad though. Um, the outcomes of this. Uh, of these ones that they looked at, 37% uh, separation, uh, 22% no follow-up, 14% imprisonment, 12% death of victim, and 10% treatment of perpetrator, um, and 4% continued living together, um, and the other 1%, I don't want to talk about because it is incredibly, incredibly dark. Um, but uh, in more than three quarters of cases, recurrence was present, so it would ha it could, would happen again, again, sort of thing. Um, so this is from Munchausen syndrome by proxy (MSBP), a review regarding perpetrators of factitious disorder imposed on another FDIA. That's from 2020. As you can Ooh. see, it includes both factitious disorder. Um, Drops imposed another yeah. and but yeah exactly so the diagnostic criteria for this is very short very easy i've just got i think um five different uh, four different points here so a psychological and physical signs and symptoms or induction lesion or disease on an other are feigned in association with identified fraud b individual presents the other the victim as ill impaired or injured c fraudulent behavior is evident even with the absence of obvious external rewards and this is a very that's a very key part remember we, we got to remember that it's not a disorder if we can look at someone and say i understand why they are doing that yeah you know if you could be like oh i get why they're doing it then well either you've got the disorder or it's not a disorder <laughs> right? um, and then uh, <laughs> d individual's behavior is no longer well explained by a disorder such as delirium or, or other psych uh, psychotic condition right so it wouldn't be a factitious disorder imposed another if you were it's going through a period of psychosis yeah. you know um for example so this is why why it's such a difficult one to talk about because it's very difficult to wrap your head around isn't it do you find more so than i was expecting oh, right? i, I yeah. guess yeah i guess the part a part of it why it's so difficult to wrap your head around is because there's a massive gaping hole as to why like like that's just it's just such a non like such an it's not an understandable thing at all why somebody would do this mm -hmm. and so i think building any form of understanding you have to just sort of focus on observing the phenomena mm -hmm. because building any kind of understanding of it well the foundational layer is not there it's just, it's hard it's hard to understand it and i mean it it i guess the way that we sort of set up our uh society the way that we deal with people and their actions uh when they are harmful to others or erratic in some way and, and all of these things we can label these behaviors as disordered and so almost necessarily we label this behavior as disordered but it it's i think it's almost less understandable than um something like say ocd or mm. um depression all of these other things you can almost get inside the head of someone and be like oh i, I guess i kind of get i can understand all of this sort of thing right mm. that makes almost logical se like you so can many build disorders, an understanding of it if, yeah, yeah you can build a framework to understand so it. many disorders even in their irrationality yeah can appear in some senses logical yeah right like even sort of uh oh gosh did right that make that makes sense as a response to trauma Right, yeah. that your brain would be like, okay, cool, this real bad, so um, I'm a separate. I'm a separate. I'm a I'm a split up, bro. You deal yeah. with this, and the <laughs> rest of us are gonna chill out back here. Yeah, you know, like that makes some sense, some logical sense. Dissociation, you know, like DPRD, right? That makes sense because you go through a traumatic experience, and your and your body's like, yo, I ain't in my body no more. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Like it disconnects. It disconnects you from like the traumatic experience just abusing a child like in the first instance is 
incredibly like i think incredibly difficult to wrap your head around like why you would want yeah. to do that yeah. but doing it in this very specific way that a num like you know obviously not very many people seem to do but like a at least some significant number of people do sort of consistently that um in sort of almost predictable ways it i i don't i don't get it yeah. like i and it doesn't even it's like it doesn't seem to be out, out of a i want to harm this this kid you know what i mean because like you're taking them in for care like if you just want to harm a child there are easier ways to do it but it's it also make not sense. like i want i want the doctors to do a bunch of tests on my child to check they're okay uh, because you're inducing some of the bad symptoms exactly yeah. there's there's no there's no way, like so many things, there are ways of going, oh, I understand why. But this one is just so weird. Yeah. And it's I, so, like, your goal, if you care about this child, then your goal is for it to do well. But then you, and, and so that you could maybe form a framework as to, like, I'm faking a bunch of illnesses so the doctors will test every single possible thing just in case that has it has the thing and, it, and they find something. But then if you're inducing those things, then that doesn't make sense. But and, and in which case you have to apply an understanding of like, okay, you don't love the thing, mm -hmm. but then you still care about it. And you're taking it to doctors and stuff. And so you do love the thing or don't you? I, and I'm sure someone listening right now might, might be mm. thinking, you're so right. Dissonance yeah. is, is the perfect word for it, right? Someone listening right now might be thinking, well, maybe we just don't know what their motive is. Well, let me tell you this. There's also simulation, which can easily be confused for FDIA. Um, and simulation, um, and I'll we'll just read this as a quote. It's from uh, it's from a paper from 2017, Munchausen Syndrome and Munchausen Syndrome by Proxy, a narrative review. Fantastic paper, actually. It says, simulation is not considered a mental disorder. It is included in the DSM-5 and defined as intentional production of false or exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated mm. by external incentives in order to avoid mandatory military service, avoid work, obtain <laughs> financial compensation, wow. escape from criminal problems, process or obtain drugs simulation differs from factitious disorder in terms of motivation for production of symptoms in simulation the extent the incentive is external while factitious disorder lacks this incentive we just we, like, there's no incentive it doesn't make logical sense until yeah. you slap this label of disorder on it which like you know it, it makes sense in terms of um how we as a society try to engage with and perceive the world like if we don't understand something or if it's harmful um and and, and out of the ordinary we slap the label disorder on it which mm -hmm. you know you, you we, we 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 can talk about sort of um the sort of good and bad of the label disorder but it's kind of irrelevant um to the to, to the point that's being sort of made here right now it's just this is baffling to me because it's just something that doesn't make any sense and that, and and that is almost it, the, the fact that it doesn't make sense is almost the reason for it being classified as some kind of disorder mm. rather than just plain abuse yeah you know like it, it, it there's almost there's almost not much to say here because it's just what what do you say Jamp and I were at the top of this you you sort of cautioned us away from this mm -hmm. um Jamp and I sort of mentioned um, oh well maybe it's to be in the role of carer because like one of the theories about standard Munchausen's mm -hmm. is like you want to be in the you want to be cared for you want to be in the role of ill person because you like the experience of being cared for now that's not necessarily why people are doing it mm -hmm. um, but it's one hypothesis as to like what the what the motivation might be and and again all of these things big flag of hypothesis big flag of like just mm. us like spewing things around because because there's no explanation and it's mm. so frustrating and you want to try and understand it like you can understand the possibility of somebody um wanting to be in a caring nurturing role wanting to infantilize their child forever so that they, mm -hmm. they never have to not be in the role because that gives purpose it gives you so much purpose to feel like you're needed and maybe if your child is never going to grow up because they're so ill and, and that, that kind of thing might obviously for many parents that would be sad because you want your your child to have as much possibility in life as possible um but it could be that you're addicted to being in the position of carer mm -hmm. and so you constantly try and recreate that position for yourself again well, you're not far off to, of some hy hypotheses yeah. that we've got so i mean i'll just skip to my uh, sort of what causes um what causes this section and i mean the reasons why it happens are fully understood 
We don't mm. really know. You, you can hit on something there that um, when it comes to sort of uh, factitious disorder imposed on self, um, you're right. Like it could be because of the sort of wanting to be in that role of being cared for or being or, or, or whatever. But in this case, it could be that the sort of the carer or the parent just just uh, and this is from the nhs i believe um they said that the, the parent or carer will have a need uh for their child to be treated as if they're ill or as being more unwell than they really are their behavior is intended to convince doctors that the child is ill this may be because the parent or carer gains something such as attention support or closeness to the child or maybe because they have anxiety or incorrect beliefs about their child's health mm. and they need these beliefs to be confirmed and acted upon but it, crucially, it says, and again, I'm quoting, the parent or carer is not always fully aware of the reasons for their own behavior. Right. And a lot of people, as we've as we've seen, that with um, with sort of um, FDIA, um, have uh, personality disorders. Um, and obviously, and this is coming from the NHS, they're characterized by emotional instability, impulsiveness, and disturbed thinking. So, like, this is... I think it's something that we're not going to be able to necessarily wrap our heads around. We're trying to apply our own logic to it, but yeah. even sometimes the people that are doing it are like, I, I don't know why, I, like I don't know why I'm doing this. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and, and there could be lots of different reasons. It's, absolutely, it's, it's like an umbrella term for like some people might want attention, some people might want to be a carer, some people might be paranoid about their child's health, like, and all those would be labeled under the same thing. Exactly, you've 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 come to the almost um, exact one of the exact problems with labeling any non-normative behavior as a disorder and now obviously with this it's harmful behavior to another so that makes sense but like we we really test the limits when we just um when we take a non-normative behaviors and we slap a disorder label on them because what that does is it it groups them yeah. right so in some cases that's very useful right because there's consistency across them um but grouping this when there could be so many different causes and reasons internally it's it's difficult, right? It, it, it you could almost consider it to be limiting because it, you're then looking for the cause of yeah. uh, factitious disorders, um, mm. rather than looking for the causes for these people's behaviour. It almost reminds me of remember when we were talking about um, what was it called Stockholm syndrome. Now that's not really a thing because um, I mean, for one thing, it was blown up by the media and 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 you know the police that were involved in that situation were really not helping the hostages hostages very much. And if we're being sort of rational people, we can understand um, why um, it would they the people involved in that situation would have presented with um, Stockholm syndrome, uh, you know. But by calling something Stockholm syndrome, by saying, "Ah, we you shouldn't want to, you shouldn't like the people that have kept you hostage," um, and if you do like them, that's Stockholm syndrome. What you're doing is almost erasing the individual sort of, um, I guess, motivation for a said sort of um, action or said yeah. presentation, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you're not like you're you're necessarily sort of disregarding the fact that someone might have a valid reason, um uh, say a valid reason. Someone may have like a um an understandable, understandable reason. Reason yeah. rather. Yeah. Um they might have they, like if you take a bunch of people hostage in a bank, um and and then the media and like all the, like the world wants to go, ooh, bad person. Mm -hmm. But then you find out the person taking them hostage has like six hundred thousand pound dollars of um, debt to their cancer treatment mm. and their children are dying and like like this is what Breaking Bad was kind of about wasn't it it's like Breaking Bad is about um, we've got this idea of like uh, someone who makes meth right and then mm. and then giving a reason it's like it creates this in incredible cognitive dissonance where mm -hmm. it's like ooh person doing thing I think bad but also I like person. Mm. How do I make this make sense? I'll stretch it out over like five seasons. And yeah. it strings you out until the end where you're like, I like person, but person really, really bad? Yeah. Do I still like person? Ooh, ooh we're going to think about this a lot and watch the ads. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and what I'm saying here is not that this should not be classified as a, as, a, as a disorder, but what I'm pointing out is that there is perhaps the chance that we are limiting our understanding of these cases by trying to understand them in the context of the disorder as as a whole, mm. right? Does that make sense? Mm. Because any answer that you come up with in each individual case must then necessarily gel with or um, sort of uh, corroborate the the disorder as a whole, yeah. Right, and mm -hmm. and that could potentially be limiting if there is if those if that behavior can be explained in some sense outside of the disorder which is why obviously we have uh so many caveats when it comes to disorders for example we have the caveat of if you've got an understandable reason it ain't factitious disorder and if you've got another yeah. thing 
It ain't that either. Yeah, if you've got... Well, if you've got... Not necessarily just another thing. Like psychosis. Psychosis, yeah. yeah. Well, if you've got another reason, or if you've got a thing that makes you think you've got a reason... Yeah. Then, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So what you're saying is, Munchausen's by proxy is like diarrhea. Oh my god, stop. Not everything is diarrhea. Not everything is diarrhea. It is, it's a symptom. It's not- like gay people. <laughs> <laughs> Much more apt. I like that. <laughs> explain? No, explain. It's so, a reference to previous so episodes. has a, Corey has an incredible quote that's like, being gay is not the symptom, it's th- is not the disease, it's the symptom. Yeah, being gay isn't yeah. a disease, being gay is a symptom. Now, what I mean Just by like that... Just like diarrhea is not a disease, it's a symptom that yeah. can be caused by lots of things. And being gay could be caused by some genes, it could be caused by some nurturing, um... And uh, just like diarrhea, uh, it, it has multiple causes um, and is and is a presenting symptom as opposed to a, 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 the cause. Yeah. Yeah. And a key point there is that if you've got 10 people with diarrhea, you could have 10 different reasons that someone has diarrhea. Yeah. yeah. You know, so in the same sense that if you look at 10 gay people, we don't know what makes people gay, but there could be 10 different sort of pathways to that person being, to being gay. gay. Exactly. Yeah. And that that's that's all I'm really pointing out here. Let's just quickly run through the symptoms or the signs rather of um of FDI A. Goodness me. Fetishist disorder imposed another. So um here is what the sort of people will look out for, right? Um uh, here are some of the warning signs and I'll just rapid fire through these from the NHS. Uh, symptoms only appear when the parent or carer is present. The only person claiming to know his symptoms is the parent or carer. The parent or carer doesn't let healthcare professionals see the child on their own. The parent or carer uh, talks for the child, or the child refers to the parent or carer rather than speaking for themselves. I'm sorry, I'm just getting flashbacks to watching that Gypsy Rose um, yeah. sort of TV show. I never watched it. It was very good. Yeah, it was very good, but like th- all of these things were present in, at least in this fictionalized um, version yeah. of this case. Can I quickly yeah. ask a question? Yeah, there? go for it. It, it, it seems to be implied potentially implied at least that um the child ha- because they because the care because they want to be there with the with the child when the care is there um that the, the child sort of learns to pretend to have the symptoms or learns to answer that they do have the symptoms i don't think it, that it's necessarily the child learns to pretend it's i think look at it this way if you're a child and you know the the person that um when you're growing up your only way to interact with sort of the greater world is via your parent. Yeah. Uh, as a child, you know, uh, you sort of relatively, you know nothing, um, and your parent, relative to you, knows everything in the world. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you. I that. Nice. Right. Yeah. So you can you can learn um, essentially uh, everything. You learn everything um, primarily via your parents. And so if your parent tells you you are sick, you can't then say no, I'm not. Because your understanding of what sick is <laughs> comes from the person who's telling you that you're sick. Yeah. Um. And 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 that's kind. Of, I think that's kind of where it is. And if you go to the doctors, and you're often going to the doctors, and you t- you could tell the child, for example, no, you you're not. You can't answer this because you're not able to answer it properly. I know. Right. And they'll look to you to yeah. answer to answer it for them. Yeah, so All of up. these different things, right? And and uh, what I'm pointing out here is that it's it's not necessarily that the child learns to lie. Uh, but even especially when the child is like, you know, when it, the symptoms are being induced, the child doesn't necessarily need to lie. Um, but like that, that in, in the cases where it's not being induced, that's why they would uh, speak over the child or they sort of train mm. the child to, to refer to them. Mm. All these sorts of things. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I, I guess the point is that it's not about making the child also pretend um, because it, you're the kid's world. Yeah. You, know? you, you, you can manipulate them into sort of doing or saying whatever really Mm. so uh some other uh some other warning signs is that um the child has inexplicably poor response to medicine basically uh, medicines uh don't work in the way that they that they should like really really they work poorly um if one health problem is resolved then a new set of symptoms might suddenly appear um or the symptoms don't seem plausible or um you know like oh for example oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh he's been bleeding this is for the nhs um he's been bleeding profusely um but the kid seems fine and you're like well if he lost that much blood he would be quite ill mm. or like, no mm. he he hit his head very very oh he hit it so hard and and look and, and you look at the head there's no lump and there's no concussion you're like yeah, his head. i don't think, he did. I think he's he fine. His head. or you know um or the parent or carer and this is i, I just want to go through these because they're very interesting and it, it it makes sense to sort of know uh how these sort of present um uh, constantly sort of changing uh doctors or going to different uh care facilities is another one um or daily activities for the the child the victim being limited 
far more than you'd expect for someone with genetic condition. So, for example, um, let's say, you know, you've got you, you tell a child, oh no, you can't go out, you can't go and play outside because um, you'll you'll mm. you'll simply perish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know they've got like something they've they've got something that wouldn't uh, 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 fever. prevent a, yeah they wouldn't prevent a child from going outside sort of thing. Um, Inc- incredibly yeah, yeah, yeah. like sort of yeah. hyperbolic there sure. but you get the or like a low immune system or exactly like yeah, yeah yeah poor immune system um you can't go outside you you can't leave, oh, see other stuff. people yeah. ever exactly anyone tries to talk to you exactly them. exactly like yeah cover your mouth um <laughs> uh, um and uh you've also got um uh recommended treatments and reassurance not being accepted by the perpetrator or the parent or carer um and they insist on new treatments or uh, looking into it further or um the parent or carer and this one is this one is a pretty pretty grim the parent or carer encourages medical staff to perform often painful tests and procedures on the child a test that most parents would only agree to if they were persuaded that it was absolutely necessary um and here are just i'll just run through the types of abuse that are present um in in these so like usually these are sort of um found out sort of uh, upon sort of diagnosis um of the sort of perpetrator the parent or the carer exaggerating distorting or lying about their child's symptoms or medical history or tests or diagnoses and bear in mind all of these are cases all of these are uh, abuse these are all abuse and that's why i'm going through them just just so we know because people have this really crappy view of abuse where they're like if if you weren't hit then it's not abuse you yeah. know what i mean like it's if, if if it wasn't physical then it's not abuse and it's just like that is it's not how it works yeah. right you can abuse a child without laying a finger on them and people need to understand that so um, exaggerating, distorting, or lying about the kid's symptoms, medical history or tests or diagnoses, falsifying documents, deliberately contaminating or manipulating clinical tests to fake evidence of illness, um, like, you know, messing with blood and urine samples and whatnot, um, poisoning their child with, um, uh, with, uh, sort of unsuitable or non-prescribed medicine. Um, and that's not just, uh, <laughs> so like you could obviously, you could obviously say that they're poisoning their child with a uh, medicine that they know doesn't work, it won't work because they're not ill, but also poisoning their child for like, with like just, um, with just other medicine to make them appear ill. Right. Mm, yeah. So both of those things in, Inf- oh, gosh, infecting their child's wounds or injecting the child with a uh, dirt or feces. Yeah. Uh, inducing unconsciousness by suffocating their child, not treating or mistreating genuine conditions so that they get worse, or withholding food, um, uh, resulting in like you know um, uh, when the when the child is young. Because bear in mind, the this frail is, look. Yeah, remember, yeah. no, but bear, bear in mind, this this often is diagnosed when children are under a year old, yeah. or sorry, fourteen months old, so just over a year old to just under three years old. Yeah. Um, withholding food to stunt their physical and mental de- uh, development oh wow yeah um it's and it's just it's just not nice at all to think about like i mean if you look at the case of Gyp- gypsy rose for example right like it was uh you can't have sugar or you need to be in this wheelchair sort of thing um all all of these different things that you just sort of lie to the kid about but let's just quickly go over how you would sort of deal with this mm. so Obviously, this is a case of child abuse. The NHS in the UK doesn't manage it alone. Um, you get the police or social services involved. Um, and usually, uh, well, I mean, I say usually, but the first priority, obviously, the, the top priority here is the child, yeah. right? The, is the victim. Um, so you protect the child, you figure out how they are, and you um, you get them healthy again. Um, so you've got a plan of rehabilitation for the kid. Um, and then you get a social care team involved as well. Um, you try and get them back to a normal lifestyle, um, and you know you've got to you've got to give them sort of ongoing um, ongoing help, give them a realistic understanding of how how their health is and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and this is something that it points out here. Uh, the NHS website points out it's common for older children to feel loyal to their parent or carer and a sense of guilt if the person is removed from the family, which makes sense because like. You, like mm. this is what's really this is what's really in it like it is really difficult i think for a lot of people that uh, um you know like uh, quite a few people have said this to me that like you know your your parent can be um the worst right but you still have so many people saying well they're still you've, you've probably heard someone say this right they're still, they're still your, still your mom yeah. it's like you know it, you you almost cannot vent about um about you know a parent without someone be like oh well it's still well it's still your dad well it's still your mom you yeah know, Right, but maybe we should move our society away from that sort of thing because it doesn't matter what your familial relationship with is with someone. If they're abusive, they're abusive, and that's bad, right? Yeah. 
training kids to feel loyal to abusive parents just leads to more kids being abused for longer. Um, so there's that problem as well that you've got to deal with. But once the kid is safe, you can then try and treat the parents, um, sort of, or the carers' um, underlying issues. Uh, so intensive psychotherapy, family therapy, um, sort of, basically trying to figure out what is causing this disorder and just dealing with it essentially. So if it's family therapy, that's to deal with sort of issues within the family that might be causing them to do this sort of thing. Um, the really intensive psychotherapy is sort of going into childhood issues to see where if there's anything coming from there. Um, you could be detained in a psychiatric uh, ward under the Mental Health Act if it's, if it's real bad so that, you know, you could basically closely monitor them. Um, and it says on the NHS website that the best results are achieved in cases where the parent or carer understands and, and acknowledges the harm that they've caused, is able to communicate the underlying motivations and needs that led them to fabricate or cause the illness, or is able to work together with the healthcare and other with healthcare and other professionals. So that is factitious disorder uh, imposed on another or Munchausen's by proxy syndrome. I mean, it is. In a lot of it, it's it's horrific when you really dig into it, you know. Yeah. Like we've we've been light throughout this episode, but I want anyone listening to know that we we're not making light of sort of the actual situations that are affecting mm. actual people here. Mm. Um, you know, it is it is truly horrific, and honestly, um, I guess getting this out to more people, understanding this to a greater degree, uh, can only help, right? You know, you you've seen the si- you've seen the science to watch out for. You know, um, you can find them on the NHS website. You can find them sort of in in many places. Um, and yeah, it's just something that is that is spoken about almost in this uh, this sort of fantastical way, where it's like, oh my god, this this crazy, insane thing. But the reality of it is that it is it's child abuse. You know, it's just horrible. Mm. Exactly. And like, we've got cases like Gypsy Rose, which are, I guess, honestly, like not non-normative. Like that went on for a long, long, yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, and resulted in a in a sort of in a murder. You know, it's it's a true crime story, if anything. And that's yeah. why people latch onto that one. And that results in a sort of misunderstanding, I think, of of how this of how this works because necessarily the uh, parent is painted as a villain, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not saying that they, they they don't do horrific, disgusting, awful, awful things. Um, But that, I don't think the viewpoint of seeing people as irredeemable um, sort of, uh, you know, like uh, villains villains is useful in helping people like ultimately, right? Like, you know, I don't think saying, ah, this parent is evil and bad is a necessary uh, part of removing the child from the parent and treating the parent for their condition and treating the child f- for you know um, uh, for their trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't think it's necessary to say this person is evil. Like we don't understand why they're doing it. Like there there could be underlying mental health issues. And well, they don't understand why they're doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying have sympathy for child abusers, but what I'm saying is that like um, painting anyone um, as a villain. Um, when it comes to mental health uh, issues of mental health is i think unhelpful it's not conducive to solving Mm -hmm. the problem i Mm -hmm. think understanding the behavior and dealing with it like you know i'm not saying oh let's go easy on let's let them deal with the behavior absolutely deal with the behavior but painting the person as a villain is an extra step that i think hinders any actual progress Mm -hmm. because instead of seeing this as something that we need to understand or figure out or or deal with in some way it's just look at these evil people and the evil things that they do Mm. right you you know you don't you don't put evil people in therapy to make them less evil you chuck them in jail to make them you know to make them pay yeah um and that's not necessarily going to be the best that's not necessarily going to be the best thing for the family or for any of the individuals involved so you know um just just Whatever. I don't know how to end this. You guys got anything you want to say? No. There's nothing to add. Yeah, that was horrible. It's just horrible. It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, thanks, Corey. Maybe, maybe we'll. Maybe we'll... Thank the patrons for this one. Oh, yeah. Thanks, patrons. Yeah, thanks, patrons, this. for this trauma. I'm, I'm not. I don't like doing dark <laughs> stuff. The dark stuff is the patrons' fault. Blame them. Let's just cheer it up a little bit. Let's just bring it up to the end <sighs> with a quick fire quiz. Dun, 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 dun. FDIA edition. Well, the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after finished asking the question wins. What do they win, Jem? Nothing. You gosh darn right. Luke, what is your buzzer? Okay, I'm going to go with a normal one this week because it's too horrible. Eh. Good. Jem? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's so, how I feel. My question for you is... 
What is another name for Munchausen by proxy syndrome? Uh, Jamp, I think you came in with the side first. Uh, 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 oh, FDIA, which stands for... I've forgotten the F. Something uh, dis... Uh, no, let Jamp, no, let Jamp no, answer. Uh, um, oh my God, how have I forgotten the F? How have I forgotten the F? F's in the chat. I've actually forgotten the F. That's horrible. Okay, Luke, you're coming in for yeah, a chance to steal. Fictitious disorder inflicted no. on another. No, no, no. no. incorrect, Jam. Oh. Another steal. <gasps> factitious disorder. Oh. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. It is <laughs> factitious. F A C T I T I O U S. Disorder imposed on another. That is it for us now. Well done, Jam, for winning the quick thank fire you, quiz. Let's move on to thanking. Uh, let's move on to thanking our patrons. Yeah, and thanks, patrons. Realistically, though, the patrons that we're thanking right now. It's a horrible experience. No, the patrons that we're about to thank right now, the new patrons, are probably not responsible oh, for this. Thanks, oh, patrons. Okay. So let's actually Don't genuinely do this. thank them. The only patrons we like <laughs> currently. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, we like them all, but this is a horrible. We love experience. your suggestions. Yeah, this was not a fun. This was not a fun one to do. Especially for you. You, 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 you had you had to do it twice. Yeah. You had to research it, then say it. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, it's hard to Ooh. it's hard to make a light podcast about something that Child dark, isn't it? Yeah. So let's first go through and thank all of our new patrons. I'm going to thank Sarah Jones. Thank you, Ruth Murdoch. Thank you, Jaden Davy. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Desiree Doll. Thank, thank you. Sorry, I'm so sorry. We'll say it together. Thank, thank you, Miley, Miley Essex. Essex. Thank you, Alexander Finn. Thank you, a puff of puff. Thank you, a puff, a puff is the rhino. Wow, Great you got name. like one and a half thanks there, a puff is the rhino. Thank you, a puff is the rhino. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Two and a half, amazing. A pop, a pop, a pop. Thank you, a puff is the rhino. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that is it for us this week. We hope you had, uh, I was going to say, a good time. We hope that the episode no. is over for you now. We had a horrible time. Before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thank you to executive producers Rosa Rodriguez and Donito. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe to new episodes every Monday and why not leave us a nice wee comment. You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, here on YouTube and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com you can follow me at not Corey everywhere you can follow me at jamkin everywhere you can follow me at luke cup everywhere goodbye goodbye goodbye, goodbye.